thanks again for joining us, uh, especially on a Saturday. We know that you know it takes um, takes some time out of your weekend, but we're really really excited to share with you what we have um, today. Uh, we have a, a amazing lineup of of speakers, um, and we're going to have some great discussion afterwards. Um, before I continue with my opening remarks, I would like to take a moment to recognize and honor the fact that I'm presenting from Haudenosaunee territory, specifically of the Ganyagehaga or Mohawk Nation, an area which is now known as New York State. For our first symposium, we wanted a theme that would set a tone for our platform as being supportive of scholarship that helps to challenge the complacency we have found in academia while recentering marginalized and uncomfortable histories through the study of material culture. That is why we chose our theme, history should make you uncomfortable. History should make you uncomfortable is a phrase that we believe calls into question what it is we think we know. Too often, history in the grade school cl classroom is taught as a factual recounting of events in the past. While more specialized iterations of history class teach increasingly nuanced and even critically analyzed material, what we are taught at a very basic level does in some way stay with us and influences the way we think. By insisting that history should make you uncomfortable, we are insisting that there is more to the story than you think you know. History should make you uncomfortable also asks scholars as well as the public not to just approach the subject of history with a critical eye, but to think about why these uncomfortable histories that we know to exist have not breached mainstream understandings of the world. It calls into question authority and visibility in the historical record and asks learners to question why it is we learn the things we do. By recentering these marginalized and uncomfortable histories, our capacity to learn grows exponentially, not just as individuals, but societally. Finally, history should make you uncomfortable, simply put, insists that the learning process should not be an easy or comfortable one. That is not to say that learning should not be a positive experience but rather that discomfort is an effective tool of learning. There's always a level of discomfort attached when one is faced with a new idea or experience, yet it is pushing through that feeling of discomfort where personal growth is found. It is through discomfort that one can learn to be a better learner. It is for this reason and so many more that history should be Now, it is with great pleasure that I introduce our morning panel, Rewriting the Narrative, Challenging Historical Authority. Sophia Cheatham will start our morning off by supporting political activist, sociologist, and interdisciplinary artist W.E.B. Du Bois within the foundational framework of Afrofuturism. By claiming Du Bois as a proto-Afrofuturist, she asserts Du Bois' contemporary relevance. Sophia is a teaching artist, podcast host, and designer currently earning her MFA in Intermediate and Digital Arts at the University of Maryland, Baltimore County. Sophia earned her BS in Electronic Media and Film from Towson University. Next, we have Alexandra Harder, whose presentation will engage with consumerism, colonialism, and nationalism through the analysis of an Egyptian scarab beetle souvenir. Alexandra is earning her MA in History and Museum Studies at Tufts University and received her BA in History from the University of Richmond. We will also hear from Rachel Trusty, who will re-examine the concept of queer failure in the context of queer abstract art through a critical analysis of Felix Gonzalez Torres's Untitled, Placebo Landscape for Roni, 1993. Rachel is an artist, art educator, and independent curator currently attending a PhD program in women and sexuality studies at the University of Kansas. Delphin Outoulari's presentation focuses on a painting by the Safavid artist Riza Iabasi called Reclining Nude, circa 1590. Delphin is an art history graduate student at George Washington University in the BAMA program. She moved to America for her undergraduate studies in 2016 from Istanbul, Turkey, and currently works as an intern for docent programs at Smithsonian's National Museum of Asian Art in Washington, DC. To end our morning panel, we have our keynote speaker, Alice Proctor, who CMSMC's content chair, Hope Elizabeth Gillespie, will introduce. Our panelists will reconvene after Alice's presentation for an engaging Q&A. Um, as attendees, please note that the chat function will be switched off for the duration of the webinar. However, we encourage that you ask questions via the Q&A function. 
Um, please also note that from 12 to 1 p.m. we will have a brief break to allow our afternoon panelists to come in and get set up. Um, we will be using the same link, so if you wouldn't mind exiting the meeting at that time and then re-entering at 1 p.m. using the same link, that would be great. Um, and finally, before we continue, I would like to thank our symposium committee, Perry Buke, Victoria Moore, and Sarah Henslick, without whom this symposium would not have been possible in the slightest. Thank you. And now, without further ado, here is All right. Uh, hi, my name is Sophia Cheatham. Um, I'm a Baltimore-based conceptual and social practice teaching artist, digital storyteller, and afro futurist pursuing my MFA at the University of Maryland, Baltimore County. Um, and today I'll be defending the thesis of this presentation and paper by making a case for W.E. Du Bois as a proto-Afrofuturist. Oops. <laughs> Uh, so what is Afrofuturism? The term was coined in 1993 by cultural critic Mark Derry, who describes Afrofuturism as speculative fiction that treats African-American themes and addresses African-American concerns in the context of 20th century technoculture, and more generally, uh, African-American signification that appropriates images of technology in a prosthetically enhanced future. And we'll see examples of that in the next slide. This vision encapsulates the fantastical, which is most Afrofuturism in the mainstream. When I applied to intern as a research assistant for a forthcoming Smithsonian exhibition on Afrofuturism, I wrote that what appealed to me about the field is its ability to, to be loosely defined and uninhibited by academic conventions. It broadens the scope of what can and can't be and allows it to exist on a spectrum for both the mundane and the fantastical. So this is what I consider uh, the fantastical Afrofuturism in the mainstream with musicians like Sun Ra, George Clinton, and Janelle Monet, along with novelist Octavia Butler, and most notably the 2018 Marvel film Black Panther. And on the other end of the spectrum is the mundane. This was proposed by visual artist and writer Martine Sims. In 2013, she wrote the mundane Afrofuturist manifesto, which was originally uh, published through Rhizome, then released as a feature length film by the same name by Kayset. Her work is a critical analysis of mainstream or fantastical Afrofuturism, essentially calling it boring and trite. She urges Black artists and activists to reshape, redefine, and recreate the mainstream norms of Afrofuturism. Sims suggests a viewpoint, of that, of, a viewpoint that mutes the fantastical ventures into outer space and otherworldly high-tech phenomena. Instead, she retools Afrofuturism to encompass the more mundane uh, advancements Black people are making here on earth to further themselves in envisioning a more equitable space for Black livelihoods in the future. Martine focuses on the here and now, she, stating that the imaginative challenge that awaits any mundane Afrofuturist author who accepts that this is it, earth is all we have, what will we do with it? Which brings me back to uh, my thesis. The claim or fact that Du Bois encompasses both the mundane and the fantastical aspects of Afrofuturism in the praxis of his life's work. To the left, there is an image of his, exhi his exhibit, uh, <laughs> exhibit at the Paris Exposition in the year 1900 uh, with works that I'll talk a little bit more about later. Du Bois was born just five years after the 1863 Emancipation Proclamation. Situated in the North, his, his birth state of Massachusetts provided him with the kind of intellectual freedoms that would later foster his political actions. The subtle beginning and the turn of history granted Du Bois the opportunity to achieve some of his major accomplishments like becoming the first Black person to earn a PhD from Harvard University. Du Bois moved to the South first in 1885 to attend Fisk University in HBCU in Tennessee, then again in 1897 to begin his teaching career at Atlanta University. 
Being in Atlanta provided him with the opportunity to study the sociology of Black uplift occurring in Georgia, a phenomenon that was enabled by intensely unified Southern families. Um, Du Bois' work predates the more recognized civil rights movement in American history, but lays much of its foundation with contemporaries such as Booker T. Washington and Marcus Garvey. One of the main differences between Du Bois and a peer like Washington is that Du Bois didn't settle or didn't accept the status quo. One of Du Bois' earliest political actions towards mundane Afrofuturism involves challenging Booker T. Washington's 1895 Atlanta Compromise. This speech was an agreement to the exploitation of Black labor through political disenfranchisement in exchange for the right to basic education and fair legal rights. Though Booker T. Washington was a strong advocate for Black people, he was willing to settle for less in securing a future of equitable Black livelihood, livelihoods with the stipulated terms that Blacks would not ask for the right to vote, they would not retaliate against racist behavior, and they would tolerate segregation and discrimination. Du Bois's rejection of this compromise is a testament to his will and imagination to want more for Black folk. Du Bois took a less passive approach, rejecting the bare minimum civil rights that the compromise offered. His refusal to accept the existing conditions of Black people also presents itself in his challenge of the widely accepted scientific racism of the time. Many influential change in lawmakers promoted the theory of Black intellectual inf inferiority, allegedly based on factual data and supported by Darwin's survival of the fittest concept. Du Bois, is, du Bois used statistics to refute these claims and reject the white, its white supremacist roots, supremacist roots. These data visualizations, illiteracy, and Negro children enrolled in public schools, along with many others compiled by Du Bois et al., serve as artifacts of counter-memory, disproving theories of racial inferiority, and demonstrating Black uplift. I'll let you guys look at this slide for a little bit um, before I start talking to just see how many different styles and forms of uh, data visualizations he had. The expanse of Du Bois' data visualizations constitutes mundane Afrofuturism and Du Bois' focus on the here and now, earthbound progress Black folk were making to better their lives, or in Afrofuturist terms, propel them into the future. He went on to showcase this work internationally, um, the picture in the beginning um, of the Paris Exposition, aiming to shift the universal narrative of Black degradation by way of slavery using this data as well as photography. These works came out of his professorship, professorship at Atlanta University, leading a group of researchers using Atlanta as a case study in the progress Black people have made since emancipation with benchmarks by decade beginning in the 1860s. These are all housed by the Library of Congress, uh, if anyone's interested in seeing them close up. And I also highly recommend the book on the left, which is a compilation of these visuals visualizations. The authors do a great job of putting his work into a larger context. Uh, while Du Bois' academic work largely focused on sociology, his Afrofuturism also existed in the literary sphere. Amongst his popular nonfiction texts like The Souls of Black Folk and Black Reconstruction, Du Bois was sure to dabble in speculative fiction writing with texts like The Comet and Dark Water on the right and The Princess Steel on the left, which was recently found and published in 2015. These works on the other end of the spectrum now solidify Du Bois' place within both the mundane and the fantastical. Set in 19th century New York City, the comet bridges disparities between race and class to tell a story about a white woman and a black man who are left as the only two local survivors after an asteroid impact. This story gives us an idea of the race relations and new kinds of interactions that may occur in a near apocalyptic scenario. Similarly, 
The Princess Steel takes place in the New York City of Du Bois' time amongst the skyscrapers and national industrial development. Told through the lens of a honeymooning couple and a kooky old sociologist, the story examines both race and gender relations within the historical context of the capitalist and colonialist steel mining industry. One striking concept that Du Bois invents for this story is that of an instrument which is able to see the great near, that which is neither the far great, a reference to the telescope, nor the near small, which is a reference to the microscope. Both inventions revolutionized our scientific understandings of the universe. Similarly, the great near positions itself as a social political device able to see cultural phenomena as moments that are large or great in their social scale and both physically and mentally near and their consequent impact on their immediate surroundings. In The Princess Steel, Du Bois crafts an allegorical critique of the social constructs that he fervently works against in his real life. As I look back at these works, I am struck that over a hundred years ago, Du Bois was writing from the same data-driven framework we see in big data today. Du Bois purposefully uses these incredibly stimulating ways to portray large sums of data to keep his viewers engaged and therefore interested in the subject matter and in his efforts to change the mindsets of the North American society at large. Just as popularly established science fiction writers like Octavia Butler and musicians like Sun Ra have been credited with influencing the concept of Afrofuturism, so too we must include Du Bois in our discourse. It is in this regard that I claim space for Du Bois as a proto-Afrofuturist. Moving forward, we must make space to attribute to him this claim that is profoundly supported by his biography and even more so in the wake of the Princess Steel. Here are some references uh, if anyone's interested in this information and a link to this paper can be found somewhere in my website or looking up the title of this uh, presentation. Thank you for your time. Um, and that's it for me. So thanks. So good morning. Thank you all for having me. Uh, my name is Alexandra Harder, and I'll be looking at cultural consumption um, in an e Egyptian uh, alabaster scare beetle. Um, okay, there we go. So for the ancient Egyptians, scare beetles were symbols of immortality and protection. Um, amulets and similar trinkets meant to resemble the beetle were often placed within the wrappings of mummies as they were prepared for their entombment and a lot of ancient jewelry features the beetle as well. My own scarab, which serves as the inspiration for this study, was of course not taken from an ancient Egyptian tomb. Rather, it was given to me as a gift um, in an, by an alabaster shop owner for purchasing what I suspected was an overpriced candle lamp during my travels in Luxor. Nevertheless, my scarab beetle is full of ancient Egyptian symbols, from the shape itself as a scarab to the carvings on the base that resemble hieroglyphics. However, when one looks closely at the, at the beetle, it becomes clear that while it may be attempting to resemble an ancient Egyptian artifact, its inherent identity as a souvenir shines through. From the rough and uneven edges of the beetle to the symbols attempting to pass as hieroglyphics on the base, my scarab does not quite measure up to the artifacts that were discovered in the tombs of ancient Egyptian royalty. And here it's pictured. Um, the scarab is, however, evidence of a broader history. Within its rough carvings, one can read evidence of Egypt's past under European hegemony and the widespread cultural consumption that began in this period and continues into today. Not only that, but this cultural consumption can also be read in part as the Egyptian nationalist response to European colonialism. Ultimately, the scarab is a souvenir from my travels in Egypt and therefore is also taking part in this cultural consumption like so many other souvenirs like it. I'm using the term souvenir as David Hume used it in his book, Tourism, Art, and Souvenirs. Quote, from the perspective of the producer, the souvenir needs to represent the culture and heritage of the tourist destination. 
the more nodes of heritage that can be tastefully invested in the souvenir by the maker and recognized by the consumer, the better. For the purposes of my study, I would argue that my scarab meets this criteria in a fairly nuanced manner. For while it is representative of Egyptian culture, it's also part of the history of colonial consumption, which then triggered the subsequent Egyptian response of manufacturing souvenirs for this demand. Over time, as modern Egyptians came to foster nationalist sentiments and contest colonial authority, there's a shift in the production of Egyptian souvenirs from the purpose of meeting colonial demands to a feeling of nationalist pride. All of these nuances can be read in my small scarab beetle. Cultural consumption is a complicated concept that has seen many different contexts throughout history. For the purposes of my study, it is helpful to limit this term to the kind of European Orientalism that was defined by Edward Said, which is basically the stereotyping of the East by the West in a systematic manner, which sees a reduction of numerous diverse peoples into an undifferentiated other. Egypt in particular has seen um, a, part, a specific kind of othering in a phenomenon that is known as Egyptomania among scholars. While it may at times be a simple admiration for Egyptian culture, Egyptomania has become widespread across the world, and Egyptians themselves have been known to take part as well, um, as they take nationalist pride for their country and culture and encouraging the tourism industry, which has become a significant part of the nation's economy. So while admiration for Egyptian culture is not necessarily a negative thing, likewise, the cultural consumption that is associated with this Egyptomania is not always a signal for colonialism. However, before we can get to the nationalist response, it is first necessary to examine the colonial past. I mentioned earlier that my scarab beetle reminds me of the kind of amulets and trinkets that were often placed within the mummy's wrappings as charms for protection. While my scarab may be a reference to these ancient Egyptian artifacts, there's another layer to this parallel that is rooted in European colonialism, particularly that of the British for it was the British who made Egypt a protectorate under their authority after Napoleon's 1798 invasion failed. It was during this period that Victorians began to consume Egyptian culture on a broad scale, and Egyptology was established as an academic field. Similar to my own scarab, the British people also began to acquire their own souvenirs, although theirs tended to be actual ancient artifacts. Through the consumption of Egyptian culture in this way, the British asserted their authority and control over the North African nation. The forms of this consumption varied and could consist of unwrapping events of mummies, popular literature, and the placement of ancient artifacts in museums as part of a narrative that argued for ancient Egypt's place as part of Western culture. Unwrapping events began as parts, parties excuse me, for the British elite. The demand for mummies for the purpose of these social events as well as for the perceived medical benefits of mummy flesh, came to be so great that the supply was even supplemented with modern mummies, created from the bodies of modern Egyptians, that were produced by charlatans in order to satisfy the market. As Egyptology came to be more solidly established as a scholarly field, and popular consumption was more limited as this field became professionalized, these events did not cease. Rather, they were simply held with a more academic slant. An example of this can be found in archaeologist Margaret Murray, pictured here, um, her unwrapping event at Manchester University in 1908. While her purpose was to bring reason and understanding to the British populace, the cultural consumption of this event is nevertheless evident. For at the end of this public event, the audience was invited to queue up and receive a free souvenir of the day, a piece of the linen wrappings that had been pulled from the body. Even within the scholarly field of Egyptology, consumption of Egyptian culture was still running rampant in this period. When I, was first close, when I first closely was observing my um, scarab beetle, I quickly noticed the symbols etched on the base. Excited by, by what I initially perceived as hieroglyphics, it only took a small amount of research to determine that what I initially perceived as hieroglyphics were actually only symbols pretending to be so and were therefore unreadable or at least unreadable to me. This led me to wonder if the British felt similarly hindered by a lack of access, as their close encounters with ancient artifacts became less readily available as time went on. As Egyptology became more professionalized and more effective policing of Egypt's antiquities export laws was established, 
the populace had to instead turn to fiction literature to satisfy their desires for consuming Egyptian culture, thereby signifying the continued fascination of all things Egyptian by the British. This is also part of the historiography of this field, with some scholars arguing that the mummy's curse genre of literature was a, di a direct con consequence of the British occupation of Egypt in 1882, a genre that continued into the late 19th and early 20th centuries. The depiction of the mummy as a monstrous creature can be seen as an Orientalist reaction to a mysterious ancient culture of which little was known and was only just beginning to be studied. An example of this um, type of literature can be found in Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's short story, Lot Number 249, in which a monstrous and terrifying mummy, which is only ever known by the number assigned to it at the time of its auction, is controlled by an Englishman who purchased it. In the story, the mummy is only ever a tool to be used to complete the villain's murderous aims. Various other Egyptian artifacts are described and presented as objects of cultural consumption in the story and described in such a way that cannot be seen as more foreign and other. Therefore, it is ultimately British culture and in a broader sense, the British nation that is depicted as superior in the story. Not only is cultural consumption continuing through literature, but European notions of superiority are further encouraged in stories such as these. Finally, while my scarab beetle is not exactly a museum quality object, the souvenirs that the wealthy British people brought back with them as objects of curiosity certainly were. Many of them eventually found their final resting place in a museum, some a bit worse for wear and many having a patchwork provenance at best. Even the Cairo Museum has its origins in this period's colonialism with the intended audience exclusive to Europeans and only serving to further ideas of European control in the nation. It became a place where Western powers could include ancient Egyptian culture as part of the foundation of Western civilization, as the ancient Greeks and Romans were already considered. This universalist narrative helped to further European control and consumption of Egyptian culture, along with the idea that the artifacts needed to be rescued from the very people to whom they were, they form a part of their cultural heritage. Egyptians did not wholly accept this, however. This can be seen within an account from a contemporary newspaper article in which is described the discovery of Coptic artifacts. Local Egyptians protested, arguing that they had a hereditary right to the artifacts as the descendants of those who had placed them there. The idea of the artifacts in need to be rescued is seen when the article reports that the Egyptians attempted to take them by force with quote, violent hands, and the danger to them is only heightened when what is described as a group of Muslim Egyptians also tries to lay their hands on the treasures. While the article admits that the Coptic Egyptians did have a right to them, they are deemed unfit to care for the artifacts. Instead, the artifacts were put safely under European control, presenting a continuation of the consumption of Egyptian material culture. Nevertheless, here we can see evidence of the Egyptian response to this cultural consumption, which will be con the concern of the last half of this study. I see evidence of this within my scarab as well. The shop where I acquired the beetle was filled with rows upon rows of pyramids, sphinxes, camels, and other similarly kitschy items. I remember being more interested in the scarab at the time than I was in the lamp I had just purchased, especially when I discovered the symbols carved into the base which prompted me to wonder, how did these types of shops that cater to tourists become so established? And why were modern Egyptians seemingly so eager for their culture to be consumed in this way? The history of this modern cultural consumption begins with Muhammad Ali, who's pictured here, the Ottoman Pasha and Viceroy of Egypt from 1805 to 1848, who allowed Europeans to appropriate antiquities for what he saw as financial and political benefits. The Pasha, who wanted to westernize Egypt and foster political relations with European powers after Napoleon's invasion, as well as likely recognizing the pressure that was being put on Egypt from European powers, was known to gift ancient artifacts to visiting European dignitaries as a means by which to achieve these aims and encourage good relations between nations. It is also worth noting the cultural context that allowed for the piecemeal sale of Egyptian antiquities. Ever since Egypt came to be under Ottoman rule, it was a majority Muslim nation, and this certainly shaped the manner in which Egyptians came to think about their own past 
and their own material culture. Elliot Kola, in his book titled Conflicted Antiquities, details the Islamic response to ancient Egyptian artifacts. According to the Islamic viewpoint, the pharaoh was a villain who did not obey God, and ancient ruins of this pagan civilization is therefore taken as evidence of God's authority over creation. However, as the field of Egyptology became more established, modern Egyptians began to rediscover their own history, which then resulted in contesting European authority and encouraging patriotic sensibilities. This nationalist response was also a legit legitimizing argument for your Egyptian rulers, although it was not always utilized directly by the rulers themselves. For example, the Egyptian scholar Tatawi, who's pictured here, argued that Muhammad Ali was the heir of the pharaohs. While Egyptology has its origins in European colonialism, it was now being used for Egyptian nationalism. Ancient Egyptian material culture served as the battleground for this colonialist and nationalist struggle. Artifacts came to be seen as evidence of the differences between Europeans and Egyptians. And for many modern Egyptians, these artifacts served as the material facts which is tested to their own history and identity. This still continues into today with the extensive tourism industry within the nation. Many Egyptians study Egyptology and indeed make a career of it, perhaps the most well-known Egyptian Egyptologist today being Zahi Hawass. Many more, however, work as tour guides at sites like the Egyptian Museum and the Pyramids at Giza. Egyptomania and Egyptology have therefore combined to create a substantial tourism industry within Egypt. This tourism industry has sparked the creation of a different kind of material culture, the Egyptian souvenir. Made locally for the consumption of tourists, these souvenirs are in some ways based on nationalist pride that encourages further consumption. Sites like Hana Halili, um, which are the two pictures in the middle and on the right side of the screen, um, overflow with um, souvenirs for tourists. Small stalls selling souvenirs can be seen at almost every tourist site, from the pyramids at Giza to the Valley of the Kings. It was at this kind of shop aimed at tourists that I acquired my scare beetle. While these shop owners were um, are certainly attempting to profit off of the demand of tourists for souvenirs, there's a simultaneous feeling of nationalist pride and a feeling of being proud of history, whether it be the history of the pharaohs or one's own family history. For example, the alabaster shop owner, whose name I remember was Ahmed, from whom I purchased my lamp and scarab, told us about his family shop. His father managed it before him and his grandfather before him. It's an established family business that has depended on and made a profit from the tourism industry. And he was clearly proud of his family business while also showing a nationalist pride for his country, similar to that of the tour guides who also encouraged this cultural consumption. Therefore, it has been shown that Egypt has a long history of cultural consumption, both from a colonialist and a nationalist perspective. And I see all this reflected in my scarab, which now sits quietly on my desk, unassuming and seemingly uncomplicated. However, um, the scarab is a kind of ideal souvenir for how it represents Egyptian culture. It's an Egyptian symbol made by Egyptian hands from an Egyptian material. And this object is also a piece of the broader cultural consumption that has been examined, which demonstrates that the material culture of Egypt has served as a site of conflict between colonialist and nationalist narratives. Thank you. Good morning, my name is Rachel Trusty and I'm going to be presenting on queer failure and queer abstraction. My, my doctoral research centers on identifying the claims and limits of the artistic genre of queer abstraction. Queer abstraction is a new broad genre that includes a range of art objects by LGBT artists who use their work to express their personal experiences and desires. In this presentation, I will outline some of the claims around queer abstraction. I will detail the data collection that I did on untitled placebo, placebo landscape for Ronnie, and I will discuss how my findings tie to the concept of queer failure, specifically the action of refusal. Before I continue, I want to address my use of the term queer in this presentation. I will be using queer to reference LGBT artists who have participated in exhibitions, 
around queer abstraction, I will also use it as an action verb, queering, to describe the action of subverting or confronting heteronormative power structures. This use aligns with that of scholars Jay Halberstam and Jose Esteban Munoz, whom I will discuss. While some artists like Harmony Hammond and Felix Gonzalez Torres have been util utilizing abstraction for many years to discuss themes of identity, queer abstraction as a specific genre um, has emerged in the past five to 10 years. Several solo and group exhibitions have been mounted around this concept, including Queer Abstraction at the Des Moines Art Center in 2019, Gay Gorilla, an online art exhibition at the Arcade Project, which was an online exhibition, and a show with Sheila Pepe and Carrie Moyer at the Portland Museum of Art. Both those last two shows were this year. As you can see by these slides, there have been many more. Along with these exhibitions, art historian David Getze published Abstract Bodies, 60 Sculpture in the Expanded Field in 2015. In this book, Getze re-examines the work of four abstract artists from the 60s, Dan Flavin, Nancy Grossman, John Chamberlain, and David Smith, through the lens of queer theory and trans theory for the purposes of identifying how rhetorics around these pieces personified and gendered them despite their abstraction. So what does abstraction add to the field of queer art that representational work cannot? Artists and scholars laud abstraction as a specific strategy to avert or avoid categorization and hint or enact queer futurity. Queer artist Glenda Liz Medina argued, quote, I think abstraction is a perfect way to explain my ex existence because it allows me to live in the space between a subject and an object. It allows me to explore that gray area that I don't want to define, that I just want to observe and kind of live in, unquote. David Getze said similarly stated, abstraction has been embraced for its oppositional, utopian and critical possibilities for it is an abstraction the dynamic the, the dynamic potential of queer stances can be manifested without recourse of the representation of bodies. Artists like Hammond and Gonzalez Torres also saw abstraction as a way to express desire and relationship outside of censorship. While abstraction has seemingly limitless potential in presenting queerness in many ways, the subject matter is still abstract and therefore difficult to understand. My research, re research examines abstraction as a mode to communicate queerness. Is it full of, quote, transgress transgressive potential, unquote, as ha Hammond argued, or does it make the queer self and queer desires illegible, which adds to further issues of erasure? I wanted to research whether or not museum visitors perceived queer content and queer abstraction. In order to do so, I conducted research in 2019 at Crystal Bridges Museum of Art in Bentonville, Arkansas on the Gonzales Torres piece entitled Placebo Gl Landscape for Ronnie. In, while Gonzales Torres worked mainly in the 90s, his work has been included in contemporary exhibitions around queer abstraction. Untitled Placebo Landscape for, for Ronnie is a candy spill installation. In these installations, hundreds of candies are placed on the floor of the gallery by the curatorial staff. The color of the candy wrapper and often the weight of the spill is dictated by the artist. Viewers are invited to take a piece of candy. Over the course of the show, the candy pieces and therefore the work disappears. It is up to the museum to replenish the candies at specific times. To Gonzalez Torres, the candy spills related to his relationship with his par partner, Ross Laycock. Laycock had been diagnosed with AIDS and Gonzalez Torres used his work to process this upcoming loss. The art body stands as a metaphor for Laycock's body and the wasting symptoms of AIDS. The art body slowly disappears like the physical body does. Untitled Placebo Landscape for Ronnie, this specific candy spill was made as a token of appreciation to both Laycock and Gonzalez's Torres mutual friend, Ronnie Horn. The gold in this piece echoes her sculpture, Goldfield, which is made of a thin sheet of gold foil. This piece was chosen, chosen for this research because it offers multiple levels of me measurable interactions with visitors. Those who looked at the piece, those who interacted with the piece by taking a piece of candy, and those who ate the candy in the gallery space. 
I also interviewed 21 visitors over a two day period about how they understood the work. This presentation is meant to discuss the implications of these findings in interpreting queer abstraction as a genre. So I will only briefly discuss the results of the interview. This data collection was approved by KU's IRB and the Crystal Bridges Museum. The visitors that I chose to interview had been observed looking at the piece previously. The interviews were in two parts. In the first portion of the interview, I asked visitors what their first impressions of the work were and, they, and what they thought it meant. In the second portion, I read them some information about the work similar to the overview I gave here and then asked them what they thought again about the meaning of the work. As you can see by these findings, the first interview um, of the piece, the responses alluded to either trash or consumption or a celebration or a party. No visitors identified in this first impression portion the relational qualities of the work or any queer content um, in the work. The responses in the second part of the interview can be organized into four themes, relationships, communion, disease, and museum protocols. Seven viewers related the work <clears throat> to relationships or sharing of the self. Seven people commented how the piece disrupted normal museum protocol by allowing viewers to interact with an artwork. Some of these common comments demonstrated a hesitancy in interaction, while others noted that it was an ex exciting action to take a piece of candy. Two saw the eating of a candy as a type of eating of the body in Catholicism or communion, and two participants brought back up my conversation around AIDS, discussing either, discussing either the wasting properties of the piece or the implications of eating it. So, none of the viewers interpreted the queer or relationship, relational content in their first impressions. After I gave them more information about the piece, they associated it with other familiar concepts like relationships or communion. Viewers did point out the subversive stance of the piece within the museum. An argument can be made here that this artwork queers or challenges museum protocol by allowing patrons to touch and taste artwork. But is that enough? Or does abstraction here fail at conveying ideas around queer identity or desire? For an exploration of how failure may pro be productive here to these findings and to queer abstraction as a whole, I want to discuss two seminal queer texts, The Queer Art of Failure by Jay Halberstam and Cruising to Utopia by Jose Munoz, Esteban Munoz. Both authors explore how failure can be a powerful strategy against heteronormative culture and useful for this conversation, both authors use art objects to explain their hypotheses. In The Queer, Queer Art of Failure, Halberstam looks at many forms of failure, such as, quote, losing, forgetting, unmaking, undoing, unbecoming, and not, uh, not knowing, unquote, to argue that they provide a new way of being in the world. They argue that heteronormative capitalist goals around wealth and biological reproduction are always out of reach for queer subjects. Failure should be embraced for its potentiality as an alternative mode of being. For this presentation, I want to look specifically at Halberstam's concept of the politics of refusal that they discuss in conjunction with shadow feminisms. Traditional Western concepts of feminism are based on an independent feminist subject who actively resist patriarchal forms of oppression. While this subject has been championed by feminism, Halberstam argues that other types of feminist subjects exist. These subjects embrace, embrace acts of, quote, refu refusal, passivity, unbecoming, and unbeing, unquote. Halberstam calls this approach to feminism a shadow feminism. One of the pieces that Halberstam gives as a concept of this is Yoko Ono's performance cut piece. In this famous performance, Ono sat on a stage and invited viewers to come up and cut portions of her clothing off. Little by little, they cut away her garments and her undergarments until she was exposed. Halberstam reads this piece as an example of the politics of refusal. Instead of a feminism that fights back or builds or collaborates, Ono offers a type that is dismembered and destroyed publicly without being recovered. This intentional passivity reveals the destructive nature of group mentality. <laughs> 
Jose Esteban Munoz, like Halberstam, also sees failure as a mode of resistance and an approach to create a new queer way of being. Munoz calls his approach to failure the great refusal. It, this is an action when subjects refuse to act in heteronormative and conventional ways and instead embrace, quote, experimental modes of love, sex, and relationality, unquote. He states, quote, this queer utopianism is a great refusal, unquote, that can open up or allude to moments of queer utopian futures. Munoz's discussion of the photography of Kevin McCarty further explains this concept. In these photographs, McCarty shows empty stages from gay nightclubs. It is unclear if these images show moments before a performance or moments after. Munoz argues that these stages, while barren and empty of club goers, are sites of potential. They are both haunted by the queer subjects who were once there and expectant of new ones to arrive. The photographs provide the opportunity for the viewer to imagine endless possibilities of what could happen. Here, blankness and emptiness is not a traditional failure, but a strategic one that gives the viewer agency to imagine their own possibilities. It is important to note here that both Halberstam and Munoz understand refusal as an intentional act that goes against conventions and expectations. The lack or absence of action or object should be understood as an intentional withholding. Halberstam quotes James C. Scott stating, Illegible, quote, illegibility then has and remains a reliable source for political autonomy, unquote. In terms of queer abstraction, the refusal to represent the queer subject in a re representational form can be seen as a refusal to participate in dominant and heteronormative economies of representation. Abstraction offers an alternative mode of perceiving and understanding. As Getze argues, quote, abstraction is one tactic for refusing the power of this making and for resisting visual taxonomies through which people are recognized and regulated, unquote. With these concepts of radical intentional refusal, let's return to untitled. Here, instead of a queer body in a form of a figure or portrait, Gonzalez Torres has given us a different kind of object portrait. He said of the work, quote, in a way, this letting go of the work, this refusal to make a static form, a monolithic sculpture in favor of something disappearing, changing, unstable, a fragile form. It was an attempt on my part to rehearse my fears of having Ross disappear day by day right in front of my eye." Unquote. Gonzalez Torres has acknowledged two aspects of this work that align with queer failure. First, the resistance to adhere to conventional art policies and second, the enactment of loss and destruction instead of creation. Like Ono's cut piece, Untitled provides a masochistic and self-destructive form of political action as it diminishes repeatedly. Gonzalez Torres through this has exerted a form of control over the process of mourning. Like the photographs of Kevin McCarty, the candy spills offer an empty stage of sorts, a side of potential for visitors to read and participate on their own terms. Gonzalez Torres stated, quote, I need the viewer. I need the public interaction. Without these, or these um, the works are nothing. I need the public to complete the work, unquote. For him, viewers are not outside the work, but part of it as the meaning of the work lies in its relationality between artist and site and museum and visitor. <clears throat> as the interviews demonstrate, many vi visitors did complete the work through taking the candy. They understood the relational aspects of the work as well as how it uh, subverted museum protocol. Both the relational and subversive were central to Gonzalez's Torres's practice. I want to end with this. Central to queer political activism is the fight for representation and against erasure or oppression. Queer abstract works like Gonzalez Torres Candy Spills could be read as adding to this erasure through the elimination or absence of the queer body. Gonzalez Torres saw these actions in a different way. He stated of his work, quote, all of these pieces are indestructible because they can only be endless, endlessly duplicated. They will always exist because they don't really exist or because they don't have to exist all the time, unquote. The candy spills here as a metaphorical body can disappear and still exist. The pieces are offered free to take, 
and the installation facilitates intimate sensual acts through the eating and sucking on the metaphorical body, yet they still sit outside government censorship. In these ways, abstraction and interaction provide effective modes of survival and endless possibility through viewer interaction and understanding. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I'm just going to pull up my PowerPoint. OK. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Delphine Öğütoğlu, and I'm an MA candidate at George Washington University in the Art History program. And today, uh, I'll be looking at Riza Abbasi's nudes in the absence of body hair and its implications as the ideal Persian woman. In the album page, Reclining Nude by Riza Abbasi, a naked female is shown enveloped in sheer drapery resting near a stream. Riza used silver to illuminate the movement of water, which appears dark and ashy due to oxidization. Riza gives her body a sense of airiness, highlighted by the unraveling ends of her transparent shawl. Her torso rests on the ground on top of her clothing, while her blue uh, shoes are placed right next to her feet, the blue inner lining complementing the blue hues of nature. Due to the format of single page compositions, the illustrated scene of reclining nude at nine by 16 centimeter is separate from that of the illumination and the calligraphy that dominates the page. The small scale, invites the viewer to look closely at the subject's nudity. The reclining nude is in precisely Persian moon face type with her almond-shaped eyes, heart-shaped mouth, arched eyebrows, and curled locks of hair in front of her ears. Her lips are pursed together, hinting at a smile spawned from a daydream, perhaps of a lover. The woman's eyes are closed, unaware of the gazes on her naked body. Her formulaic moon face creates an unawareness and anonymity about her identity, and the bare nudity adds tension and uncomfortability. Scholars such as Sheila Candy and Amy Landau argue that Riza could have been studying an European engraving for the reclining nude image. However, the direct idealization of her moon face her overtly sensualized body, the letter in her hand, and the garden setting along with the absence of body hair shows that Riza Abbasi was looking at the depictions of ideal Persian beauty such as the beloved. In this paper, I will further examine the notion of the European image that was imposed on Riza Abbasi's nude. Through this examination, I will argue for her Persian origins with the implications of her body hair or lack thereof derived from the depictions of the archetypal pubescent beauty in Persian literature. Sheila Canby argues that due to the rarity and acceptability of nude themes in late 16th century Iranian paintings, a European prototype of the Italian Renaissance printmaker Marcantonio Raimondi's Cleopatra engraving could have been used for the reclining nude image. During the late 16th century, following the global expansion of trade, European missionaries and tradesmen became recurring figures in Safavid ports, encouraging the exchange of material culture. Soon, their presence was linked to the, sexual was linked to the representation of sexual mores, creating debates around women's decorum, same-sex practices, and prostitution. However, the eretization of female form and male and male sexual practices in Persian paintings and literature developed outside the occidental notions. She's not a European figure in a Persian moon face type. On the contrary, she is the beloved from the Persian text and the manifestation of how literary tradition turns into visual culture. Due to this growing contact between Europe and Iran, instead of analyzing reclining nude's courtly love as the beloved, 
scholars have focused on the blunt eritization of her body, which led to her assigned identity as the Farangi. Farangi can be translated as a person, a European person in Safavid, Iran. The examination of reclining nude as Farangi illustrates that a Persian woman was assumed to be European solely due to her naked form. Even its title, reclining nude, properly used for European nude studies, inherently imposes the concept of the Farangi and further removes the subject from her Persian attributes. Compositionally, Riza clearly was not following the Cleopatra engraving. Cleopatra is shown with snakes, perhaps right after she was bitten. The highly circulated Greek texts, like Cleopatra's stories, was very common in Islamic visual and literary culture. As these texts were adopted into Persian literature, Riza was certainly aware of Cleopatra and her attributes. Knowing the theme of this engraving, Riza would have added the snake details on the arm of the reclining nude if he was following this prototype. The mentioned engraving shows the subject not only indoors, but also she's positioned on a cushion, while its Persian counterpart is shown in a garden setting on top of her clothing. Furthermore, the reclining nude's bare nudity was the reason for her appointed European identity. However, when compared, the imposed European prototype is not even shown fully naked. Her nudity that caused scholars to give her a European identity also links her to Persian visual culture. The river she lays next to is bounded by rocks with flowers bursting through them while her bare body is only covered with a see-through shawl. The setting of gardens in Persian literature refers to the paradise of sensuality and particularly its fantasy and mysticism, which evokes the courtly love of the beloved. The juxtaposition of the fruitful garden setting against the blank nakedness of the subject is further emphasized by the portrayal of the subject alone in the composition. Although the reclining nude stands alone in the fruitful garden, the presence of another person, a lover, is suggested in the composition. The lover's presence and gazing eyes are prevalent through the placement of a letter in the hand of the reclining nude. The letter reads, the man's eyes, perhaps he saw himself in a dream. Esin Atul argues that the letter is an implication that the nude figure was the dream of Riza Abbasi. However, the letter suggests the existence of a story outside the frame picture, intentionally imposing a man's eye on her naked body, implying a voyeuristic lover. He is not only present in the letter, but possibly in her dream. The gazes on her naked body is not only limited to that of the lovers, but also the audience who are struck by her dread nudity. Her bare body is even further exposed due to the absence of any body hair. The portrayal of a woman without any body hair stems from the hairless pubescent beloved from Persian poetry. Although sodomy, sexual and anal intercourse with the same sex, is prohibited by the Islamic law, the beloved in Persian literary culture is often a 14-year-old boy who is subjected to courtly love and sexual desires of grown men. In Reclining Nude, when depicting this ideal beauty of the beloved as a woman, Riza chose to assume the attributes of the prepubescent form onto a fully developed female. Persian culture's understanding of pubescent boys allows the beloved's attributes to be freely given to both genders. The pubescent form of a person in Persian culture was seen as indeterminate of their gender. According to scholar Halet al-Roheb, 
the term homosexuality based in the binary contemporary Western terminology when imposed on the beloved's relationship brings a certain limitation. A mature man's sexual relationship with pubescent boys was not seen as same sex. Rather, it was seen as having sex with a genderless person. Therefore, the homoeroticized love portrayal of boys in a sensualized manner was not understood as sodomy and its attributions were easily employed on grown women due to this genderless notion. The numerous paintings, pencil boxes, book illustration, and Riza Abbasi's own portrayal of youth with a bearded man illustrates that the beloved mainly conformed to this age-constructed same-sex love. In visual culture, to differentiate between the penetrated moon-faced beauty and the grown bearded lover, the penetrated pubescent boy was often depicted without any body hair to emphasize his youthfulness. The reclining nude follows the attributes of the young hairless boy because as a female, she is also the penetrated beloved. In Riza's Old Man with Yud, a bearded and a beardless figure are shown drinking in a garden setting similar to the verdant landscape of reclining nude. Riza has intentionally placed visual cues for the intendant's audience, the aristocracy, to identify the figure as the penetrated beloved. The fur lining of the pubescent boy, his gesture of offering a wine, are indicative of his sexual role. Riza has applied the strikingly burgundy on the shawl that wraps the beloved's base, framing his pubic area. These visual cues are similar to the positioning of the reclining nude's vulva at the center of the composition. The penetrated beloved and the reclining nude not only share the pubescent body hair standards, but also the classic Persian moon-shaped face. The formulaic nature of the moon face type allows its attributes to be used both for men and women, which further bends the gender binary. The lovers by Riza Abbasi illuminate the gender bending uh, factor of Persian moon face type. The scene shows two figures in a garden setting similar to the reclining nude. They're drinking and enjoying a courtly pastime. Both are shown with plump pale faces and curvy smooth contours similar to the youthful round figure of reclining nude. It is hard to determine the gender of the figures as both are depicted in lavish clothing, covering their genitalia and embody the same facial traits. Through the elimination of their individual features, the courtly lovers suggest both a homoerotic and a heterosexual scene, blurring the gender binary. Van Riza intentionally rendered the beloved as a female Reclining nude's clothes are taken away to further sensualize her. The reason for this nudity is derived from the sexual desires of women in Persian literary texts. Women are often depicted as mischievous or even sexually charged. Her sexual lust is even further intensified by the direct portrayal of her genitalia. Riza has portrayed her pubic area with the absence of body hair to conform to the standards put by the homoeroticized pubescent lover. In fact, the presence of body hair in women in Persian culture was connected to the impersonification of demon who is a female with extensive body hair. Additionally, the Shiite belief argues that on the day of the apocalypse, a bearded woman will come and announce the coming of the 12th Imam. As a bearded woman is put in the commanding position of the apocalypse, the presence of body hair on women is further emphasized as a sign of evil in Iran.
However, these depictions are embedded in the strict Islamic law of removal of body hair. The Hadith by Abu Huraya put forth the requirement of removal of pubic and underarm hair as it was seen as impure and unnatural. In order to keep up with these standards, Safavid women plucked out their eyebrows to echo the shape of a crescent, use wax and razors to shape and completely remove their armpit, pubic, and leg hair. As the presence of hair showed the woman's place in 16th century Safavid Iran, the absence of hair also showed their class and ranking in society. Riza Abbasi's reclining nude directly follows the standards that was put on Muslim Persian women through the portrayal of a pederastic same-sex relationship. It does not echo the attributes of Cleopatra from Raimondi's engraving. As Riza was interpreting the beloved's ideal body onto a female form, his reclining nude did not anatomically depict a, um, a woman, but strived to put forth an imagery of a pubescent beloved inherently without any body hair. Thank you. All right, thank you so much. Hello, everyone. My name is Hope Elizabeth Gillespie, and I am CMSMC's content chair. Thank you so much for joining us. It is my great pleasure to introduce today's keynote speaker and fellow UCL alum, Alice Proctor. Alice is the creator of Uncomfortable Art Tours, which takes museum goers on an honest look behind the art at six different museums in London. She's the author of The Whole Picture, the colonial story of the art in our museums, and currently hosts the podcast, Historical Friction, which discusses pop culture, the past, and how the two interact in the best and worst ways. Letting us all know what is discomfort, here is CMSMC's favorite person to follow on Twitter, Alice Proctor. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm glad that I'm someone's favorite person to follow on Twitter because the last time I did a paper, I was introduced as the least professional art historian that anyone had ever met. So it's very nice <laughs> to receive that compliment. I'm just going to get my slides up now and hopefully that should all be working. So I have called my talk today, what is discomfort because I wanted to talk about this idea of being comfortable and uncomfortable within historical spaces and museum institutions in particular. I am an art historian by training. I've also got a master's in material culture and museum anthropology and my work is primarily focused on the ways that we tell stories and commemorate history in a colonial context. Of the images that I wanted to show you today, uh, some of them include one of them includes a representation of human remains and the discussion and conversation that we will be having involves the uh, idea of displaying human remains in museum spaces and keeping them in museums. We're also going to be talking about some very, very heavy themes, um, including uh, the lynching of African American people in the 20th century and in some cases also discussing histories of sexual assault and violence and the way that these are commemorated in museums. These are not easy subjects. I deal very specifically in my work with the ways that we experience uh, trauma and traumatic histories through museums. And so it's important to me that everyone is coming into this aware of what we're going to discuss and with some understanding of how these stories are told. So the first image I want to show you is something that I work with quite frequently. This is a Haida sculpture. Um, it comes from the Haida Gwaii in what's now British Columbia, the west coast of what's now Canada. And it represents a man who is coded by his dress as European and a woman who is coded by her hair, her clothing, and the likely date of this sculpture as an indigenous woman. He's holding her at gunpoint, and this is unmistakably a scene of sexual violence. I 
work with the subject on my guided tours at the British Museum. It's one of the pieces that I discuss with members of my group, particularly to try and understand the ways that we can commemorate acts of violence within museum spaces. When I talk about this on tours, I put it in the context of the number of missing and murdered Indigenous women that are still much, much more likely to be either kidnapped, uh, subjects of sexual assault, or murdered, or to disappear than their white counterparts in modern Canada. And this is a really contemporary issue as well. The roots of that sexual violence is in the history of the treatment of Indigenous women, particularly by uh, white men who came as part of the fur trade or through shipping routes up and down the coast. So there's a very real chance that this object was created as a souvenir for a European man to take home with him. However, it's also possible that it was made by an Indigenous Haida person as a kind of private monument. And it's the kind of discord and possible discomfort between the souvenir function and the commemorative function that I really try and understand when we talk about this object on my tours. It's a piece that represents grief and violence in one, and it also represents the way that that legacy is carried in the body and carried culturally through to the present day. This is something outside of the museum context. This is a newspaper board that uh, is in the city of Oslo. It was common for some of the newspapers to put up daily editions in these glass cases so that people could read them and see the main headlines without actually buying a paper. And this is the one from the 22nd of July, 2011, which was the day of the Oslo terrorist attack and the uh, killing of a number of teenagers on an island a little outside the city as well. The glass was shattered by the explosion, but it didn't collapse. And the newspaper display has been kept as a monument. It was described by the Norwegian government as ruins for the future. And they've recently relocated it to its original site, having moved it to a different park to display for a while. This is an object to me that speaks of the kind of vernacular memory that we can also hold. This has been turned into a monument. The original plan was to also construct a monument that cut a scar through the landscape near the island where the bulk of the murders occurred, but that was uh, recently canceled on the basis that it might be potentially re-traumatizing to the local people in that area. Consequently, we find these small snippets of memory work and fragments rather than an attempt to create a large scale national commemoration we see this very mundane form of memory sneaking through. That original monument proposal that cut into the landscape was called Memory Wound, and it was proposed by the artist Jonas Dahlberg. I want you to keep that idea of a wound in mind because it's something I'll come back to later on. I've seen this newspaper display board and it was one of the most moving monuments or memorials that I've ever seen, purely because of the kind of quietness of it. It's not presented in a big showy or public way. It's not in a museum. It has this very small intimacy to it. As you can see, it's essentially like being in a bus shelter. Keep in mind this idea of quiet commemoration and the levels on which we remember historical trauma. It's something that's very important to the ways that I work in that I'm primarily focused on museum spaces. And within that, a lot of the objects on display or that I discuss are pieces that relate generally to uh, the everyday lives of colonized or otherwise made people who've been made subaltern. It's about recognizing and representing the trauma that these objects carry and finding ways of connecting to that despite or against the overarching narrative of the museum as a space of triumph. One of the galleries that I work in the most is the British Museum. That's where that Haida sculpture is held. And this is the Enlightenment Gallery. It's a space in which I spend a lot of time on my tours, not only because it represents the history of the 18th century, but also because it's a kind of museum of a museum. This gallery was never actually used to display objects in the original function of the museum. It was the King's Library. And it's only been uh, on display as a museum space like this one since 2003 when the museum was renovated and this gallery became the Enlightenment Room. 
there's no information anywhere in the gallery about that anachronism. And so what we have is this very deliberate construction of a space to feel enlightenment, whatever that means. In practice, it often results in the fact that uh, objects don't have labels, the information is very, very sketchy because it's more about creating an atmosphere. This is something that interests me because we have a deliberate act of historical reenactment in the creation of this room. But the same sort of space and commemoration and restoration work is not afforded to many of the cultures who are represented in these collections. The idea that someone would want to experience the 18th century is, in my experience, something that's unique to the 18th, <laughs> the kind of cultural West and particularly Europe, this idea that that would be an age of nostalgia and glory is not something that is shared by the whole of the world. Among the objects on display in the Enlightenment Gallery, a number of them come from Captain Cook's voyages to the South Pacific um, and his so-called discovery of what's now Australia and New Zealand. The uh, whalebone ornaments that this man is wearing in this image are among some of the objects that are on display, the neck piece and the hair comb, and a copy of this engraving is included in one of the cabinets. This is a Maori man who has tamoko, the facial tattoo, which is the mark of a senior initiated man with significant social status within his iwi or community. Tamoko is an ancient and extremely important tradition to Maori culture. And the preservation of these tattoos after death was part of a practice called moko mokai, which was the creation of preserved heads. Moko mokai were used as part of funerary rites. This is a tradition that's associated with mourning and commemoration, and they would also sometimes be taken as trophies of war. With the arrival of Captain Cook, we also see the beginning of the European trade in Moko Mokai. When uh, Joseph Banks, who was traveling with Cook, attempted to purchase one of the Moko Mokai, and in the end obtains it by swapping, I believe, two pigs and a gun for one of these heads. From that point onwards, these heads appear in European collections. Uh, they become so popular to the extent that tamoko as a practice almost dies out. It's since been revived, but for a while, having tamoko is essentially like putting a target on yourself. The British Museum still holds a number of these heads in its collection. And it's very clear to me that we need to understand the museum as a gravesite. We have a deep history of human remains being held within museums, uh, respectfully or disrespectfully. This overlaps a little with the earlier presentation about Egypt and the presence of mummies within museum collections. To me, the choice of museums to continue to hold and display these objects is one that speaks to their continually colonial presence. I don't work with human remains in my tours. It's something that I refuse to take part in because I consider it deeply disrespectful. However, the British Museum continue to display these objects and I'm not just picking on the BM. There are dozens and dozens of institutions that continue to do this. However, the British Museum did recently conduct a survey and some research into the display of remains within its collection and concluded that the surveys show most visitors are comfortable with and expect to see human remains as an element of museum displays. Which brings me back to the idea of comfort. Are we comfortable with seeing remains on display because we're used to seeing them or because we genuinely find them pleasing and reassuring to see? It's impossible to pin that down without more information and as far as I'm aware this report has not yet been published but comfort is a cultural category. It's something that's flexible depending on the background of the viewer, the background of the researcher and the curator. What's comfortable for one person might be deeply disrespectful and inconsiderate to another. Within that history, it's important to recognize the role that museum shops can also play in this. These are toy soldiers of Maori warriors that I saw after an exhibition celebrating the art of the Pacific. They are essentially continuing the tradition of turning Maori people into souvenirs in a way that I found deeply violent and deeply disrespectful but it's not something that is often considered within the context of museums much more generally. I wanna talk briefly about a work of art by Daniel Boyd. This was an installation at the Natural History Museum in London in 2011-2012. Uh, it was called the Up in Smoke Tour. And Boyd was given a residency where he worked with the old archive boxes of the museum 
mainly ones that held human remains. You can see the boxes in this image and examples of the types of storage containers that Boyd was working with. At the time that he was in residence, the museum was reorganizing its stores of human remains, which meant that suddenly a great number of these boxes were available, and Boyd began using them as canvases. Using resin and pigment, he imitates the motif of dot painting, which is part of the Papunya Tula style um, and the Central Australian desert art movement. Boyd works with the idea of obscuring the image. So his dots don't come together to create a complete picture. They only give us fragments of what we can see. This one, using the lid of one of these collection display boxes, represents a man called Pemelwoy. Pemelwoy was a significant figure in indigenous resistance against the European arrivals in South uh, what's now New South Wales in southeastern Australia, and was a significant uh, figure because he gained a reputation for being unkillable. He survived bullet wounds and capture attempts and was eventually killed, possibly by a gardener, who removed his head, gave it to the surgeon of the colony, who shipped it to Joseph Banks, Banks again with his collection of heads. Boyd is an indigenous man. His family are from what's now Queensland. And during his time at the Natural History Museum, he discovered that the skull of one of his ancestors was also held in their collection. So he began a campaign to attempt to return this skull, which he succeeded in. But there are still a number of human remains held in these collections. Pemelwoy and his place within Banks's collection is important because once his head arrives in London, it comes into the collection of Joseph Banks and then disappears. We don't know where it goes, we don't know if it survives, it may still be out there today. This is the portrait of Joseph Banks that he commissioned from Benjamin West, showing him in his Maori cloak and with other decorative objects that he collected during his travels. Boyd reimagines this portrait as a kind of cartoonish figure called Sir Nobeard, which is a play on the fact that the indigenous Australian people who met Cook and Banks in the uh, 1770s did not recognize them because they had uh, no facial hair. And so they were considered sort of not quite human with their very pale skin and lack of hair. And in this case, you can see that Boyd has included a self-portrait of a head in a jar. So again, this is a reference to Pemelwoy, and this is a way of bringing his own family's history um, and his connection to the trade in human remains into the image. But he's also giving us a sense of the living people that are left behind by these stories. We have an image that shows us the living, not the dead, but gives us a sense of their ghosts and legacies haunting these pictures. Don't forget as well that there are thousands and thousands of examples of ancestral remains held in museums, whether they're fragments of hair or DNA samples that were taken against the wishes of communities and that are currently sought for return. It's not just bones, it's not just skulls, although those are the most kind of show-stopping examples. But every time we talk about the display of mummies, for example, in a museum collection, we need to understand this bigger history and this bigger context, particularly that the way that that relates to the histories of um, race science and the pseudoscience of eugenics. On that subject of heads, I want to show you a few images from the Musée de l'Homme in Paris. This is a photograph of the apparatus that was used to hold people's heads still so that they could be measured for phrenology purposes. It's a piece of technology that was used by Pierre-Marie Dumontier, who is the man whose bust you can see behind it. Um, to me, this is very clearly an instrument of, of violence and of torment, but within the display at the Musée de l'Homme, it's presented alongside some of the human casts that were made by Dumoutier and others. It's also displayed alongside art objects. So these are the busts as they're currently on show. A number of them are plaster casts that have been painted, but down the bottom and on the right-hand side of the image, you might be able to see that some of them are bronze. These are not casts that were created for phrenology purposes in the way that Dumoutier did. These were created as artworks by, among others, Charles Cordia and Benjamin Wet Law. These objects serve an artistic function. They're displayed in art galleries and they're still shown in art galleries and art museums today. But it's only when we see them alongside the plaster casts that we can put them in this context of violence and put them in, put them in frame with these other objects and these other histories.
I just want to show you the way that some of these heads are displayed. Um, in some cases, we do have the names and identities of the subjects, but mostly they are anonymous people. And consequently, there's no sense of the possibility of receiving consent from the descendants of these individuals or in many cases we know that people did not consent to have their caste made in their lifetime and so there's a real history of violation here. There is some space for rehabilitation which is perhaps too strong a word but at least reconsidering around these objects. This is a portrait of a life caste by Fiona Partington who's a New Zealander artist. It's a cast of a Maori man. As you can see, he has the full Tamako facial tattoo. And the nature of the cast means that the texture, the fact that this is not just a skin level tattoo, but it's literally carved into the skin, is visible in the cast. The lines have then been filled in for illustrative purposes. And what Partington is doing here is creating portraits of these busts. And she specifically refers to them as portraits rather than archival records or anything like that. There's a sense of trying to restore the individuality and the humanity of these subjects uh, by reframing their images in this way. However, there is a limit to what can be done when we literally don't know the names or histories of these people. On the subject of photographing remains, this is an image that I took when I visited the Mutter Museum a couple of years ago. I was perhaps naively excited when I realized this institution would prevent photography on the basis that the descendants of some of the people whose remains were held in their collection might object. However, once I arrived inside the museum, I realized that it was not the considerate space that I'd hoped it to be. And since then, I've done more research online and discovered that the museum, among other things, encouraged people to sponsor a skull in their collection. So the displays now have the name of the possible subject, uh, the person whose skull has been preserved, where that information is available, and the name of a sponsor who donated money to um, pick their favorite story and keep these collections intact. Museums are strapped for funds, but the auctioning off of human remains is a bridge too far. Coming back to the idea of the wound and representing history as an absence or a scar, this is a work by the French Algerian artist Cadaratia called The Repair from Occident to Extra Occidental Cultures. Firstly, note that he's referring to the, the West and the Occident rather than the usual Orientalist focus that we see in histories like this one. It's a display that I saw at the Hayward Gallery in London, but it's also been shown at Documenta in Germany and installed in a number of different ways. Within the display, Atia collects objects related to trauma and wounding. He displays images of scars and scars being healed. The rough wooden busts are based on photographs and casts of First World War soldiers demonstrating the facial disfigurations and scarification that they received during the war, whereas the very smooth, very polished black stone busts represent uh, individuals from disparate African cultures and communities that use scarification as a marker of social status. And so we see this combination of the wound and the scar as a representation of healing. Atia talks a lot in his work about how in the cultural West, there's this very strong focus on perfect healing. The idea that we should be able to have all our wounds disappear and be made perfect again is something that's not found universally. And in many other cultures and communities and traditions, the idea of leaving behind a mark, leaving behind a scar is a really significant one. One of the final things I want to discuss is the way that images are now recorded and spread online. So this is a photograph of Parker Bright's protest at the Whitney Biennial. Um, it later became a painting by Bright called Black Death Spectacle. This was in response to a painting of Emmett Till that was created by a white artist without the consent of Till's family. Bright stood in front of the painting for two days wearing a homemade shirt that said Black Death Spectacle as a way of drawing attention to audiences in the museum uh, to the history of spectacularization and voyeuristic violence that they were participating in by visiting this installation. 
there's a history of the photographing of scenes of murder, scenes of violence, and particularly the history of photographing lynchings that's important to remember here. Till was famously photographed in his coffin, but that was an image that circulated for very different purposes. It was a galvanizing moment that was appreciated by his mother for the civil rights movement more broadly in America. Whereas the circulation of this painting actually served only to enhance the career of the artist. Um, if you want more evidence that cancel culture doesn't really exist, you can look up the career of the artist that made this painting and realize that she's still doing great. We have to also put this in the context of historical images of violence that relate to the history of the slave trade and enslavement. The photographs of uh, Renzi and Delia, among others, um, are held by the Harvard University Museum. They are daguerreotypes that show a group of enslaved people. They were posed, specifically modeled um, to be documents of these individuals, but they were taken without the consent and without the permission of these individuals and Harvard still holds the copyright to these images. Tamara Lania and other descendants of the individuals re represented in these daguerreotypes have claimed the copyright. They've requested ownership of these images because they wish to have some control over the representation of their ancestors. The fact that the university continued to profit from these images is symptomatic of the way that we accept and take for granted that museum culture and objects of violence become the property of the institutions that control them, rather than allowing that ownership and that possession and control to revert to the descendants of those represented or held within these collections. And in relation to that, images by Ken Gonzalez Day deal with the history of lynching by removing the bodies of the victims. This is something that sits quite differently to what Atia is doing. Atia is focusing on the idea of the wound left behind, whereas for Ken Gonzalez Day, it's more about showing the space around that act of violence, putting these objects within their context. When you see these images that show the crowd gathered at a lynching or gathered at a scene of murder, it's very easy to lose track of the fact that this was an act of violence. When you don't see the body, you could mistake this for being just a regular snapshot of a group of people. Others are more obviously haunting. When you see the hanging trees that were used in these acts of murder, and you have a sense of the crowd surrounding the spectacle in exactly the same way that Parker Bright protested against at the Whitney. So, we can find ways of commemorating this history without showing images of violence, but on some level we have to do what Susan Sontag suggests and let the atrocious images haunt us. We need to be able to see objects of violence and see histories of pain, whilst also understanding the way that those narratives and histories have been manipulated and abused over time. It's imperfect to suggest displaying objects of trauma because in some cases that's really not appropriate at all. But for the most part, finding a way of balancing the individuals who created these pieces and the biographies of those represented with the experiences they suffered is something that I think is very worthwhile. I talk a lot about the idea of being discomforted or uncomfortable in my work. And as part of that, I wanna be very clear that we have to hold space for recognizing the way that comfort has been manipulated. We really need to see that it's possible to be at home in a museum and feel welcomed there because historically you were the target audience, whilst also understanding that that's something that we can challenge and change. I'm able to do the work that I do because I have a particular educational and racial and cultural background. I go into art museums and I don't get challenged because to the security guards and staff, I look like any other nice white girl who's a tour guide. That's something I've decided to attempt to take advantage of in my work, but it's also something that requires me to consider my own relative comfort or discomfort. Sometimes a little discomfort is important because it pushes us to do something different and to question the ways that we've been raised and educated, but 
at other times, it's more important to recognize that comfort is not necessarily evil, that it's not necessarily bad to want to seek comfort, to want to seek peace and acceptance and acknowledgement within these museum spaces. I can't speak for everyone, obviously, but there is nothing invalid about wanting to be able to go to a museum and not be assaulted by images of trauma and violence. I'm very grateful for having the opportunity to take part in this conference because I can see how much work is being done by all of the other speakers and participants to try and deal with these histories. And something that I'm deeply invested in is the idea of creating a museum space that respects and considers histories of violence whilst also refusing to spectacularize them. I don't know if that's possible. I certainly don't believe it's possible at the moment, but my hope is that one day we will reach that point. And in focusing on the ways that we tell stories of the most violent acts and the most violent experiences of history, we can also attempt to recognize the more everyday and the more mundane uh, aggressions of imperialism, whether you call those microaggressions or um, just everyday experiences of, of violence and racism, but also by recognizing the way that colonialism and colonial history has its tendrils in the present day. Thank you. I think we're going to do a Q&A now. So if you have any questions based on this, let's do that. All right. Alice, thank you so much. That was incredible. Um, I'd like to take a moment to invite back our morning panelists who are also going to do the Q&A with us. Um, while everyone is kind of getting back situated, uh, we have a general question that we would like to ask all of you. Alice, obviously, please feel free to start. Um, what does history should make you uncomfortable mean personally to you in your research? Um, you talked obviously a lot about discomfort just now, but if you could give it a one-liner, if, if there was like a headline, what would you say? Okay. <laughs> History should make you uncomfortable because the idea of seeking consolation from historical figures is something that I personally think is deeply flawed. The idea of finding heroes and ancestors in the past is very understandable and something that has a huge amount of value but at the same time, as soon as we begin to kind of sanctify those figures and treat them as untouchable, we lose sight of their humanity. And so to learn from the past and to recognize our heroes and to celebrate them adequately, we also have to hold the discomfort of their reality and their flaws and that sort of thing. Perfect. Sophia. I felt a little conflicted about um, the title history should make you uncomfortable because I I was trying to understand who the you was and the gays, uh, the white gays came to me and it felt a little passive aggressive in the in the calling out and calling in but trying to address harm. And so but I did feel like this was a valuable conversation and I wanted to hear the perspectives and the um, what material cultures would be brought in today. Um, and so that's my perspective. It's a con conflicting but necessary conversation. Alex? Sure. Um, to me, it means just trying to approach historical sources and figures um, as honestly as possible. I mean, there's always going to be bias, but just trying to be aware of one's own biases and time um, that you are in and just, but still trying to just, you know, be responsible with how you're approaching your subjects and not trying to fit them to um, like one's own agenda or anything like that. So just trying to be honest as much as possible. Rachel. To me, it has to do, I think, with the uh, kind of interrogating things that we are normally provided or that are told to us that are true and to really kind of dive into that and, and look farther, right? So um, I think now, 
you know, histories are being politicized maybe in a certain way or certain histories. And so um, being able to examine those a, a little bit more critically and knowing that, that even though you are being critical of certain things doesn't mean that you don't want to support them, but you just want to understand the nuances of everything farther. Delphine. Um, for me, when I was looking at the reclining nude image, I, throughout my whole um, research, I felt very uncomfortable because I was looking at a relationship of a pubescent boy with a grown man. But if I didn't push that uncomfortability, then I wouldn't have been able to uh, see that she's actually not a European. So that uncomfortability in that whole notion kind of removes her and rewrites the history of her uh, Persian origins. So I think that's why it's very important to kind of push yourself in those uncomfortable uh, subjects because usually uh, we need to change the history as most of us has shown. Uh, things have been written um, in a very Eurocentric way um, in most of these objects. Awesome, going off of that a little bit, um, someone has asked, they loved all of your presentations, by the way. Uh, how do you see uncomfortable topics being presented in the future? How, and, and furthermore, a, a question that I often ask myself, um, is what gives us the authority to kind of change those narratives? Um, and how do we go forward doing that? So whoever would like to start, please go ahead. Um, I'll go. I think the reason that we we should take up on this authority is that for years European scholars have taken up on the authority of examining these um, objects. I'm specifically talking about Islamic art since it's, that's my focus. Um, they have taken on this assumption that there was a power dynamic between the Europe and the Middle East or the Islamic dynasties. If we do not rework and take this authority from those scholars of the 19th century or the 20th century, then, as I said, the reclining nude is gonna be known as a reclining nude as a European study. It's not gonna be known for what it was or its intended purpose. So that's why we need to take the authority to basically rewrite these um, histories a little bit. Does anyone else wanna add anything, please? All right, cool. Let's move on to the next question. Um, this is a question specifically for Sophia. Um, in 2018, there was an exhibition titled A Measure of Humanity at the Columbus Museum of Art that essentially repositioned different data representations as works of art. I was wondering if you thought of Du Bois' data presentation in that way, and if so, how might that also contribute to understanding Du Bois as a proto-Afrofuturist? Uh, yeah, that was a great question, and I looked up the exhibition um, in between the time. Uh, I totally consider Du Bois' data visualizations as works of art, especially as a designer myself, and spending many years uh, teaching and um, creating what was called social design, um, which is socio-political based um, design making. And I would love to see his work in a museum space um, within an uh, interdisciplinary exhibition. And I, definitely expect his uh, name or maybe work to come up in the forthcoming exhibition on Afrofuturism I mentioned. And uh, lastly, I used him as an artist reference in my own MFA thesis, so I am considering him an artist and I include his visualizations and reference to his creative writing. Awesome. Um, we have another question. What challenges did you face in finding and explaining that uncomfortability in your topic? What were the most difficult hurdles for you in discussing uncomfortability? This is a question for everyone. Mm -hmm. So something that comes up a lot in my work and that I tried to address in my talk is the relationship between museums and human remains and the fact that in many cases we see ancestral bodies put on display um, for shock value rather than actual empathy or anything like that. And in many cases, these represent interrupted funerary rites. I choose not to work with human remains. When I run my tours, I avoid them entirely. And I generally avoid using images of them um, wherever possible. 
I dealt with this in my book by just not using those images, um, which was a really tricky decision to put to a publisher, it turns out, um, even though the whole argument was about the fact that the display of human remains was disrespectful, there was still this pressure to show what I was avoiding. Um, this is something that comes up a lot for me in terms of encouraging audiences in museums and in academic spaces as well to consider what it means to display a body because it's something that we frequently take for granted. I am also very, very aware of the fact that I don't personally come from a tradition where uh, the where the bodies of my ancestors have been put on display in museums. I'm outside of that history. And so in attempting to bring up this conversation and encourage people to think about it, there is an extent to which I am then complicit in this spectacularization. And that's a really fine line to walk. That's a really difficult thing to try and manage. I hopefully am doing an okay job of it, but it's very much something that's an ongoing process in understanding how we represent and discuss these histories. Uh, Alex, I actually want to pivot to you on this a little bit. Um, so I know from my personal experience, I am an Egyptologist by training. Um, bodies, particularly in, in what you and I look at, are, are famous. They're, they're absolutely famous. And you talked about Margaret Murray unwrapping. Um, I know that there is another person at UCL, Dr. Angela Sen, who does uh, talks about uh, mummies, and she, her work is excellent. Can you speak a little bit to that? Yeah, um, it's definitely something that's been done since the period that I start with in my study. Um, I briefly mentioned that mummies themselves were consumed as like medical materials. Um, so like physically consuming um, remains. And thankfully, I think that the attention to the, or that this issue has had more um, kind of attention drawn to it because of like just recognizing and learning more about um, ancient Egyptians themselves and how they're displayed in museums. For instance, sarcophagi are meant to be closed. Um, so displaying them in museums open um, is, you know, an issue. Um, and I think that now that there's kind of this recognizing of that, then I hope that <laughs> maybe they will be displayed in more respectful um, ways that take into account that uh, culture, but um, yeah, we'll see. <laughs> uh, Rachel, I want to pivot to you with the next question. So um, it's about how our verbal skills interact with material culture and how those pre how we present material culture verbally when also talking about discomfort. And so I know that Untitled is a little bit tricky. I know that personally when I encountered Untitled for the first time, I was very confused. Um, and it also creates a sense of discomfort in the fact that the viewer is looking at it and they don't necessarily know what to do because you don't take candy at a museum, right? That's just, that's crazy. So can you talk a little bit about how verbalizing that kind of discomfort with that kind of display works? Well, I mean, there's two different, you know, positions. Uh, I think that Gonzalez Torres is perfectly happy with people not knowing what it means. I think that he, you know, per his instructions via the foundation, the Gonzalez Torres Foundation, just wants the label to invite you to take a piece of candy, not instruct you. And so there's an openness. Um, he did cite in one of his interviews that he saw a woman who, within the gallery space of Andrea Rosen Gallery, an early exhibition of one of these candy spills, that she was so upset by the work that she picked up a bunch of pieces and dumped them in the trash. And he felt that this was a violation of the work, which is interesting in the idea that it can be violated. Similarly, I think there was an exhibition of a spill in Korea, um, in, uh, I think it was in Seoul uh, a couple of years ago, where a um, art protest group came in with like, uh, like uh, brooms and bags and sweeped up the whole thing in one sitting and took it with them. And so it's interesting that while it's supposed to be open and kind of democratic, that's a problematic term, but you know, like totally interactive in whatever capacity, there are misuses of the thing. Um, but then on the flip side, now, you know, several years later, it being put into queer abstraction shows is I think where I'm interested in 
what queer and abstraction mean. And so to tie back to some of your prior questions, like the discomfort here is that yes, number one, I am for queer representation in museums 100%, but if both queer and abstract mean everything, then we don't have a consistent genre. So my position in interrogating some of these things as an artist myself is to say, if we are going to call queer abstraction a potential genre that demonstrates some sort of changes, then we need to be specific about what works go in them. And not all works that are made by queer artists or all works that are abstract should be queer abstraction. And so by this account, yes, I think that Gonzalez Torres's queering of the museum site, right, this queer time, queer space shift would qualify as enough. Um, but looking at the body of queer abstract work, not all of those objects I feel should be queer abstraction because some of them look like pure abstraction, which is hegemonic, masculine, minimalist, and carries all that baggage. Um, so, you know, where's the queer in it? Um, so I think we should have limits, which I think is a controversial position in this. Does anyone have anything else to add about the, the intersection of actually of limits and, and what we should be limited to, how we should be, who should limit, how we should limit? Limits, limits, limits. <laughs> no? Okay, let's move on. There's a, actually, Alice, someone is asking, um, so I'm not sure that they understand how your tours work, um, because it, yeah. So um, just to clarify, Alice does not work for the British Museum, but if you want to talk a little bit about how your tours work um, in reference to that question, it's about your ethical dilemmas in, in working for a museum, but you don't. So if you want to just talk a little bit about it. Yeah, so I have a, a strange position within museums because I am an independent guide who doesn't work for any of the institutions where I, where I run my tours. Um, I take advantage of the fact that we have free national museums in London and I bring groups of people without prior permission or permits into the gallery space. Um, this is something that it's possible to do because of the way that the museum industry runs in this country. It's also something that I'm able to do because of the particular privileges of my background and my education. I have worked as an official tour guide and a professional tour guide in places and so I'm very good at slipping under the radar um, and an important element of my work as a tour guide is this idea of sort of Trojan horsing difficult history into the museum uh, against the will of the curators or keepers of these collections in some cases. I have a slightly difficult relationship with some of these institutions however I am able to keep doing the work that I'm doing in part because of the press coverage that I've received and the fact that many of these museums and galleries didn't find out about my work until I was already getting quite a lot of media attention and then it was a little too late for them to stop my tours without it backfiring. Um, so my position within these institutions is a slightly fraught one. Um, I don't work for the British Museum and I choose the galleries where I guide based on the objects that I think will have the most resonance with my groups. This also means that I don't have any say over what's on display. Um, and so I'm very much responding to the collection as it's put forward to a public audience. I don't have access to the backroom conversations about what goes into these labels and how they're created. And so my work is much more responsive than curatorial in that sense. Awesome. Um, Delphine, we have a question for you. It's somebody's asking for a little bit of clarity. Uh, why exactly has the primary narrative about reclining nudes reduced it to clearly arbitrary similarities to European counterparts? And uh, is this mostly a product of ethnocentric art historical discipline? Um, yes, um, it's very embedded in the Eurocentric way of looking into Islamic art discipline. Um, the main reason for um, for its attribution as the reclining nude uh, to the Cleopatra engraving was the only the reclining position. Um, this was uh, put by the scholar Sheila Camby, and in that she explains that since they are both reclining, um, it could be the same. And since the figure, uh, since nude themes were rare in Iranian paintings, mm -hmm. it has to be, um, uh, it has to be, uh, inspired from a European engraving because Iran didn't have new themes 
which is completely wrong if you know the story of Shirin and Kusru, which is one of the most highly circulated texts in Iran. There is a scene actually where the Shirin, the main heroine of the story, it appears naked next to a stream while she's resting. So it's actually very similar to the reclining nude image. And um, as, the, uh, as I first started working on this, I was arguing for her, um, I was arguing that she was actually Shirin, but the more I looked into the absence of body hair, uh, it was very clear that she kind of follows this pubescent form of a beloved from Persian literary text. So to keep it short, it's definitely based on that Eurocentric art historical um, discipline. Excellent. So this is going to be our, our final question before we uh, take our lunch break. Um, and it's about Orientalism. Um, so Edward Said, uh, brilliant book. I know it's a cornerstone of my education, and I'm sure it's a cornerstone of a lot of people's education, talking about the, the orientalizing of um, different cultures. Um, so the question is, someone was wondering if you had thought about the connections between the Orientalist assumptions of the contemporary Orient is primitive um, and how that idea is actually pushed through in educational settings and, and through our educations as archaeologists or art historians or historians. Um, anybody, actually, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go to Alice first and then to Alexandra for that. Unless you don't want to, totally fine. <laughs> no, it's okay. I'm just trying to, this is quite a rich question. <laughs> um, to me, I think it's important to understand this within the context of Orientalism as a moving definition. Mm -hmm. um, so the motifs that we see come through and what we would more conventionally, un conventionally understand as Orientalist, which in particular is focused on um, North Africa and parts of, uh, parts of Western Africa as well, is this idea that it's the furthest place that you can safely go. Mm -hmm. um, and there are predecessors to that in particularly the representation of parts of the Mediterranean, parts of the reach of the Ottoman Empire as well, and this idea that the, the most exotic, most Orientalist thing that you can imagine is the place that a European tourist could reasonably get to and just about manage. Um, so the idea of Orientalism as a moving target is something I'm very interested in and the way that we see these, these forms kind of create and recur. Um, and to put that in the context of the consumption, it's something that's very, very much linked with, in my mind to tourist culture. Um, and I think that modern tourist culture is the direct descendant of sort of 18th and 19th century Orientalism and many of its motifs are recurring. Um, I'd be really interested to know, Alexandra, how this fits in with your work on, on souvenirs as well, because that's something that it's a very direct association, I think. Yeah, definitely. Um, and also like dealing with the, you know, kind of uncomfortable idea of I'm participating in this material com consumption as well, since I was, you know, I, I have souvenirs from my time in Egypt. Um, I think it's a complicated idea in that, like, this has been solidified through education. Um, like, there's so many activities for, like, you know, early education for kids, like making their own little, like, ancient Egyptian headdresses um, and that sort of thing. The figure of the mummy, you know, I could go on and on <laughs> about the kind of um, monstrous figure of the mummy in the horror genre um, and how this kind of also figures into this kind of orientalizing um, phenomena and that continues into modern day. It's, you know, it happened and it started in the late 19th and early 20th centuries and then, you know, we still have films and stories and other, you know, kind of pop culture items um, that just further this um, this orientalizing of ancient Egyptian culture. So, yeah. Awesome. Guys, you have been incredible. Thank you all so much. Um, Alice, thank you for your keynote. It was wonderful.
Um, everyone loved it. Guys, your presentations were incredible. Thank you so much for being our first panel ever at our first ever virtual symposium. Um, if you are joining us for the afternoon panel, please do exit the meeting and rejoin at one o'clock. Um, it's the same link, so please just feel free to come back again. Thank you to everyone, and I will hopefully see most of you at one o'clock. Thanks, guys. Thank you so much.